folks. We're here in front of the Salem Bush Village uh, establishment, established 1692, and the witchcraft, uh, oops, sorry, Salem Wax Museum of Witches and Seafarers. We actually will get to go inside, and this is one of the few places which does allow taping of their exhibits, which is very interesting. And it will have a very nice uh, congruence continuity even to the cemetery where we stand. And the memorial. Yes, in the witch trials memorial there are a number of plaques over there to the people who perished but before we get to all that let's step inside. Yes, yeah, so I did get you to come up the stairs in the back. <laughs> Sorry Selma. Watch the drops. Ah. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> when you come in here, you notice the um, plaques. And this great stage for dramas and triumph and tragedy for nearly four centuries. Once called cool, you know. Nomkeg, the area was renamed Salem in 1629. Salem comes from Shalom, the Hebrew word for peace, or chosen because of our founders. Wish this be a serene, quiet uh, place to lead calm, pleasant lives. Boy, were they mistaken. <laughs> this is the plaque basically giving a history of the place. Starting from 1626, Roger Conant uh, founding a fishery colon in Namkiag. Namkiag named Salem three years later all the way up to 1800. Salem is the richest city per capita in the United States, which it probably is no longer so today, but be that as it may. We have a number of flags, flags here, starting from the elderly Rebecca Nurse, who was a widow. She was hanged on July 19, 1692. She uh, was actually too old and tired to renounce the accusations a second time. The judges had originally found her innocent, but someone more had to be convicted, so they did. Her last words were, oh Lord, help me, it is false. The other one is Bridget Bishop, who was hanged on June 10, 1692. I'm no witch, I'm innocent, were her last words. And this is Elizabeth Howe, hanged on July 19, 1692. If it was the last moment I was to live, God knows I am innocent. Let's go inside. Mm. A number of interesting articles here, starting from barrels, often associated with sea ports, to a back of a primitive calculator of sorts. And maybe a look at it. Mm. Including uh, some of the uh, well, actually, just a second, hon. Get out of the way. No, I'm just doing a full. Okay, you're doing a full scope of this. Um, there's one here, an accuser of uh, Richard Bishop, George Herrick. Herrick was appointed as Essex County Marshal and also served as Deputy Sheriff during that crucial year of 1691. It's a Captain John Olden who lost it into custody in May of 1692, but his most infamous for his arrest of Bridget Bishop, the first victim of the witchcraft hysteria. He married, had children, and gained some prosperity, but like many who took place in the witch trials, and that fortune come to George. There's more information on him, including Colonel Lieutenant John Hawthorne, died 1717, baptized 1641, the primary figure in the witch hysteria. Judge Hawthorne was the only person never to regret his participation in the trials. A staunch practitioner, he once branded the letter B on a brother's forehead. His great-great-grandson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Yes, mm. literary fame changed the spelling of his own name by adding a W due to the shame of the relation. Judge Hawthorne resided at the corner of Essex and Washington Street and is buried approximately 100 feet from where you now stand, where we now stand. Mm. Watching this. this is the wax exhibit of the characters. I don't know how closely it resembles the historical features. Is it based on lithographs at the time? Who knows? Uh, during the Salem witch trials, about 200 people were accused of being in league with the devil and were dragged before judges to undergo intense questioning. Imagine how you'd feel if you asked questions that had no answer spirits, the evidence that wasn't really evidence against you. I don't think they meant alcoholic spirits. Mm. And you were considered guilty because you couldn't prove your complete innocence to people who had already made up their minds that you were evil. Little has changed since that day. Your friends are afraid to help you, your family is unable to, and the court is under great pressure to find you guilty and send you to the gallows. Yes. This is the statue of the aforementioned Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of the Scarlet Letter with Hester Prynne. Yes. Twice told tale in the House of the Seven Gables, which actually mentions towards the end of uh, my book, Let the Darkness Shine. I'm 
tells a story for a different day. Mm. Interesting. This is Jacob Brownshield, shipmaster of the time. And Jacob Brownshield was born in Salem on May 31st, 1770, into one of Salem's most prominent merchant and shipping families. His mother was married, Derby Crown Shield, one of the streets here is named for that, mm -hmm. from another prominent family. His father, George Sr., built a shipping business. Is, at its height, made the Crown Shields one of the leading shipowning families in New England. They also had their own more Crown Shield War. Interesting. Kind of to other shields. Anyway. Yes, and we will be discussing this guy later on. Well, yes, we can give a little bit of a history of all the people who were executed at the trials. This is uh, Giles Corey, who I've given testimony against his wife, but had later on himself been accused of witchcraft and refusing to admit to the practice of such, probably recognizing well, his own voice. Actually, it wasn't even that he refused to admit, he refused to partake in the trial. Right, ah, yes, he refused to partake in the trial and was pressed to death by having stones put on him. He actually suffered the most sordid fate because contrary to maybe some misconception when witches were burned, in Europe here they were hung. Mm -hmm. He was pressed to death. Many had been placed in jail, rotted away there for, during a period of May. Some had died in jail, forgotten, mm -hmm. unable to pay the fees if they had been found innocent or whatnot. So basically very few people had come to good ends. But this is, yes, Giles Corey. Giles Corey was a violent man who appeared to his neighbors. Fined for stealing, he also was thought to have burned down a barn and beaten a higher hand to death. A fairly disagreeable person, he apparently was guilty of many things, though witchcraft probably wasn't among them. But when he was indicted for witchcraft, he pled innocent but refused to answer to the court's authority. And the law said that a man refused to accept the court's jurisdiction could not be tried for crime. However, he could be made to say the torture, for instance, that he acknowledged the court's power and his trial could proceed. To make him talk, Giles Corey was pressed, staked to the ground in the planks while stones were piled on him. His agonizing death took two days, and when the horrible weight caused his tongue to protrude, the sheriff used his cane to force it back into his mouth. Corey therefore was executed not for witchcraft or other crimes, but for refusing to agree that the court had the right to try him. Interesting. Okay. Appropriated them as was later on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just done to the socialist revolution. Sailing in the 1700s and 1800s had nothing to do with pleasure, it was strictly business and risky business of that. Ships and their cargoes were tremendously valuable and they often fell prey to marauders. The difference between pirates and privateers sometimes was very slight, yes, very slight. Pirates were renegades who simply seized ships and cargo, often killing crews if they resisted. Privateers were part patriot. Part adventurer and part shrewd businessman. Kind of a rogue, yes? You would uh, be a privateer. Me? Moi. Mm. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the government gave them letters of uh, marque, mark, mm. and gave official sanctioning to seizing enemy ships, anything that wasn't necessary for the war, if it often a substantial part of the rich cargoes, or the ship itself could be kept by the privateer. During the American Revolution, 158 Salem ships sailed under the letters of Mark as privateers and took more tonnage, tonnage as any, than any other American seaport privateering helped Salem survive and the hardship of the times with jobs and the booty from captured prize ships. Interesting. Hmm. Again, I don't know how to use the website. historical place, but this is examples. This is an exhibit of Conan and other settlers' brave hardships to reach the New World. From its earliest days, Salem had to struggle for its very existence faced with the hard climate and poor soil of New England. And the early settlers turned to the sea for economic survival. Fishing and shipbuilding industries emerged along the banks of the rivers, but it would be trade and commerce that would initially gain Salem worldwide fame. Hmm. Interesting. Solid fellow. Ah, Philip English's crew unloaded sugar and molasses for the lucrative Caribbean trade. Mm -hmm. Philip English was one of the earliest Salem merchants to take advantage of the Caribbean trade. The sugar trade was an important link in the development of the infamous triangular trade. Barbados, molasses, and sugar became the lifeblood of Salem's economy. It's interesting also that Tichuba mm -hmm. was also... Yes, from Barbados. Yes, from Barbados. The one who started the tales to the girls, and when the girls got a little wonky, things got out of hand. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes. <laughs> 
This is the ship from Arius captured by the pirate Thomas Hawkins outside Salem's Harbor. He doesn't look like a pirate. Hmm, interesting. Well, what does a pirate look like? The triangular trade was as dangerous as it was profitable here. Well, that often goes hand in hand. The unpredictable Atlantic claimed many ships and pirates were always a threat. No place was safe. On August 9, 1689, the ship Mary was captured by the notorious pirate Thomas Hawkins just outside of Salem Harbor. Hawkins was eventually captured and hanged for piracy in Martinique. This is the Salem Pirate Lambert, sang Boston 1704, along with the notorious pirate captain John Quelch. Despite the savage pirates, the harsh Atlantic, the European War, and the infested trade and navigation acts of the English king, the merchants of Salem persevered. They were preserved. Persever oh, they persevered and they prospered. This one looks a little bit more captain. Yes, it looks more piratey. Yeah, she does look more piratey. That one looks a little bit like Niles Bohr, the one with the high forehead. Yes. Gosh. Did you know that in our hotel, uh, the Hawthorne, they have the... Um, a replica on the roof that no one can go into that is for uh, the people, the seafarers and everything. I was reading that on a plaque. I was like, no one can go in there, but it's there. Mm, interesting. Yes. Yeah, a little bit of hidden history. Elias Haskett Derby, one of the prominent men of the time. There's a street, Derby Street, named after a merchant of Salem and America's first. Hi, he was America's first millionaire. His ship, the Grand Turk, opened the trade with China upon which Salem's fabulous wealth was built. It would be the Far East trade that would make so many Salem fortunes and build the mansions that still line Chestnut Street. Interesting. Captain Ebenezer West of Derby's Grand Turk conducts negotiations in Canton, China. Gift giving, though some would call it bribery, was part of an elaborate Chinese ritual surrounding trade negotiations. With the trading complete, the Grand Turk was given a fine Chinese send off. Thousands of firecrackers were set off to awaken the gods and to provide a fair queen's home. Interesting. Yes. This is footage of Titia by the Witch, accused of witchcraft, waits outside while the afflicted girls make their accusations. As I said, interestingly enough, she herself was eventually released after a period of imprisonment, but unlike many in the trial, she was not hung. Mm hmm. Hanged, excuse me. Yes, Titcher by the witch, Titcher by accused of witchcraft, waits outside, you know, make their accusations. Uh, to save herself, Titcher but did confess, and then there was proof that the devil was abroad in Salem and recruiting followers. Inspired by Titcher by's tales and encouraged by her confession, the girls launched the great witchcraft delusion with hysterical scenes which began in a simple village meeting house. The doctor of the village at the time realized that this was in gout, scurvy, smallpox, epilepsy, soap, and therefore witchcraft. That's logical. Whenever you eliminate the improbable, that which remains, no matter how strange, must be true. In this case, it was just more convenient and true, but that's a different matter. Yes. This is Lusty. Bridget Bishop is arrested and the first to hang. An easy target, Bridget Bishop was married four times. Ah, mm -hmm. you know, a woman of low reputation. She was actually very progressive four times. Yes. And it was the belief that the soul of a witch could leave their bodies to do evil deeds. It was on the basis of spectral evidence that hundreds of people would be imprisoned and 20 others would be put to death during the great witchcraft history of 1692. Spectral evidence, evidence based on visions and dreams. This is the next exhibit of a pregnant Elizabeth Proctor is notified by her jailer that her husband John has been hanged. Uh, Goody Proctor, your husband is hanged for his crimes and likely now with his master the devil. Look now to yourself and confess your guilt or you will join them as soon as your child is born. Her hanging postponed Elizabeth Proctor escaped execution and survived the hysteria, but others were not in this fortune's nuts. Hmm? This one is the hanging of Rebecca Nurse. I would have imagined her to be old if they're actually using a woman who appears to be younger. That was the one who didn't have strength to defend herself later on. But yes, she was an elderly widow, had lands. As Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Good, Elizabeth Howe, Sarah Wilde, and Susanna Martin are about to be hanged, Reverend uh, Noyce urges Sarah Wilde to confess. Wilde curses him. We'll have blood to drink for your part in this simple day. Judge Hathorne looks on as a member of the crowd. Reverend Noyce would ultimately die from a hemorrhage in his mouth, in fact, drinking his own blood. Judge Hathorne condemned innocent people to be executed on the doubtful basis of spectral evidence. Today, Judge Hawthorne lies buried in the old burying point, not 100 feet from where you now stand. Well, that was outside. Yes. 
then witches were denied a proper burial, so the executed victims were hastily buried in shallow graves. Human limbs would sometimes be exposed after heavy rains. Rebecca Nurse's children returned to her shallow grave after sunset, exhumed her body, and provided her with Christian burial she deserved. The Christian burial she deserved. To this day, she is an unmarked grave on the Rebecca Nurse homestead located in Danvers, Massachusetts. And this display is of Governor Sir William Phipps and his wife. As they hear the news that girls have accused Mrs. Phipps, Governor Phipps puts an end to the madness. Finally, the girls have gone too far and they accused Reverend John Hale, one of the most enthusiastic leaders of the witch hunts. <laughs> Where it reached Boston that the girls had also accused the governor's wife. Governor Phipps now ruled that spectral evidence was no longer admissible in court. Without the support of spectral evidence, the hysteria quickly quieted down. Interesting. I went up the ladder and got shut down there. Oh, the rich people are never going to condemn themselves. Mm. Yes. Little Dork is Good is released from prison. She was never to recover from the hysteria. There would be a terrible price to pay for the great witchcraft delusion, and all 19 people were hanged. One was pressed to death, the Giles, mm -hmm. and many were died of illness contracted during their imprisonment. Today, those who suffer persecution are viewed as victims of ignorance, intolerance, and prejudice. Um, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. From crying. Yes. Hysteria. These are a few more random figures here. Yes. Yes. It's very interesting. A statue here of the witch trial memorial. This is basically a replica of that statue, which you may see outside. I mm don't -hmm. you know if we'll get to it today. Now we're running a little bit low, but you're certainly getting the inside scoop. I hope you can, they can, mm -hmm. can hear me over the music. Yes. I feel like I'm on the Enterprise here. Yes. Before you lie is a hard stern statue that stands in our museum. It's an immortal testament to the horrifying irrationality that swept through Salem in 1692. On the grounds with a haggard face ejected in despair lies Rebecca Nurse, who was accused of witchcraft. Rebecca was renowned as a steadfast, pious Christian woman an outstanding member of the community, the so-called bewitched children of Salem, and Putnam, Mary Walcott, and others capriciously began to blame Rebecca for their own faint paroxysms and convulsions. Sadly, in the outrageous injustice of Salem courts, those children were the only witnesses against Rebecca at her trial. Despite their perseverance, their, uh, this perverse justice, the court did find Rebecca not guilty. It was only after much commotion from the crowd along with the ghastly howls and screams of the children that the verdict was reversed and Rebecca's doom was forever sealed. Ah, I kind of wonder sometimes if the accusation from the mouth of babes, yes, and it's when facts don't matter but the feelings that we are foolishly led astray. But we had another tale for a different day. Should okay, we go downstairs? I'm gonna go. Ah, here we are halfway down to the uh, lower part. I won't call it a basement of the museum. This display here, I assume, is of one of the judges. Curiously enough, he's not wearing a wig. I don't know if that was indigenous to just English courts. I don't imagine even the courts of Salem stateside. That's probably, well, anyway. Mm -hmm. To the Marshal of County of Essex, of uh, his lawful deputy, you are in there, Magis, named hereby required to apprehend and bring before us of uh, Beverly and Dorcas Horse of Beverly Widow, all in the county of Essex on uh, Monday next began the second day of the month of next ensuing a debate here of, well, that's basically not quite Middle English, but a little bit post. The book is open to Psalms 135, 137. And that's signed by Jonathan Corwin, which was one of the magistrates of this time, and his brother, George, was the sheriff. Yes. Let's see. More. Uh, related material. This is a sample of the imprisonment. Young and old alike, the victims of unjust accusations were thrust into a dark, damp, dirty cell about the size, about this size, to await your trial, the fleeting chance of justice in the courtroom to a full room and facial mob hysteria. 
Interesting. Huh? Now uh, you need some light in there. No, no, Not it's good. These are rubbings. Particular graveyard. Basically, as we round about a trip, we went to a shop with souvenirs, t-shirts, magnets, ships. Interesting phenomena. I think that's good for this, don't you? I think that would be sufficient. So hopefully that was informative, kind of a whirlwind tour. And shortly we'll go to the graveyard to show you not reproduction, but actual originals of some of the name flags and places of burial of the accused of the Salem trials.